more complicated business of smart contracts, and the tools begin becomes less effectiveness. At this time, we need a large-scale study on the performance of state-of-the-art latency detection approach. Uh, next, I would like to introduce the methodology of our work. In our methodologies, we have we firstly collect smart contract from ESA scan and use the tools to analyze smart contract. Next, we conduct manual examination on the Lianchen contract. And based on the results of manual examination, we perform cost analysis and value the selected tool. In step one, we totally collect more than 230,000 open source smart contracts from ESA scan and remove the duplicates. After the duplication, we obtain almost 140,000 smart contracts. Instead, two, we select detection tools and use them to analyze the contracts in our data set. To select suitable tools, we propose some conditions for the tools. They are open source and scalable, supporting multiple versions of Solidity, requiring Solidity code only, and having ability to locate vulnerabilities. The figures in slides shows the tools we select. And next, I will introduce the results of automated detection. The results are present in this figure. Totally, from the Solidity version less than 0.5 to greater than 0.8, the successfully analyzed analyze rates range from 97% to 60%. Although the Solidity tools support multiple Solidity versions, the frequently update of Solidity also bring barrier for automated detection. And there are still exist more than one, more than sixteen thousand contracts failed to be analyzed by any tools. And next, total, total, more than twenty one thousand Solution contracts are reported. The reported rates of different tools are valued. This is because the different patterns used in different tools. And we also noted the distribution of. Uh, Report invention contract. From the solidity version less than 0.5 to greater than 0.8, the report rates range from 22.6 percentage to 1.4 percentage. And we manually analyze the reasons and find that they are related to the awareness of developer code base for preventing latency. For example, the latency gas developed by OpenZibling and the new types of latency. In step three, we perform manual examination on the results of automated detection. At the beginning, we, result, we record the participants as the following steps. We first invite students and introduce true positive and false positive of latency discovered from previous study. Then we let the students learn by themselves and perform testing for them. Finally, we select the students passing the testing as our participants. At first round, we divide 48 participants into 24 groups and let the two participants within one group slowly manually mark the luncheon contracts. After the examination, we obtain 97 contracts and are marked true positive by both participants. 20,626 contracts are marked false positive by both participants, and 489 contracts are marked as both the post true positive and false positive. Next, we perform second round manual examination to evaluate the results of first round. For the Common NS contract, we sample 377 contracts from, for examination. And finally, we find that 377 contracts are all false positive. So we can believe that the judgments of our participants are confident. As for the common PS and DIFs, we use a car sorting approach to exempt them. Finally, we totally obtain 34 reports. <laughs> the engine contracts are true positive and others are false positives. 
Instead of all, we analyze the cause of true positive and false positive. For true positive, we find that all reactions are related to core value function, which means that the reaction contracts use this function to call external contracts and external contracts perform reactions. For false positive, we analyze the cause of 392 sample false positive and summarize eight types of cause that lead to false positive. Next, I would like to introduce the eight types of false positive. Uh, first, the permission control contains three types. It means that the contract uses permission control to prevent reentrancy, including identity control, address control, and reentrancy lock. And no state change after external cause means that the contract do not change any state after external cause. Change state variable without financial risk means that the external cause lead to don't, does not do not need to lead to funds transfer out. And special transfer value means the funds transfer out of the contract are previously transferred in by users. And reentrancy by transfer or send means the contract transfer out funds by tra transfer or send function, which limit the gas and prevent reentrancy. And non callable function means the function cannot call other contracts. In step five, we use the results of manual examination to evaluate our tools. For truth policy, we find the precision rates of rules are limited. This is, li this is likely because of the loose patterns used in tools. And for false positive, we find that the permission control resulted in the most false positive of tools. Uh, this is because several ways of permission control make detection harder. And no state trades after external call and trades stay reliable without financial risk related to other contracts and made tools lose effectiveness. Uh, next, I would like to discuss our work. We find eight reaction seat attacks uh, from Solomic Hacker repository, and they are not caused by call value function, but caused by bad designs of using ERC tokens, logic box, and flash rolls, and so on. And these are the stress of our validity. Internal stress is related to the bias of participant in manual examination and cost analysis. We use, so we use to double check to reduce mistakes, and we will update our data set in the future. And external stress related to limited automatic detection, which cannot reflect all existing tools. But the conclusion in our work can still help research to gain a good understanding of the limitation of existing works. Next, I will conclude our work. And we perform a large-scale empirical study and use automated detection to de analyze the contract. We further perform analysis on our result, automated detection results and analyze the cause of truth policy and false policy. We summarize the limitation of uh, the selected tools in our work and find they are, find and summarize their limitations. And the data set of our work is released in this link. Uh, thank you. I sincerely thanks to the CBWA and was all research who have participated in this discussion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the talk. <laughs> Any question from the audience? Yeah, please. Uh, I might have missed it. Do you have a slide on, or did you uh, measure the time taken by other tools in uh, in anal analysis process? Uh, we. This the time taken by other tools to analyze the contracts in the data set. There are reports on true positives and false positives, but what about the time taken by tools to analyze those contracts? Are you means the false positive analysis? Uh, time, uh, execution time of tools. Did you record the execution time of other tools like Scurify and Oyente? What was the difference in their execution times? Like how long do the tool take? Okay. Uh, it means the tools, the running of tools uh, is die. And um, if we actually, some tools, uh, when we perform experiments, we actually find some tools may fail to analyze some contracts and, and they may uh, end up their contracts, end up the execution with, with some errors. 
such as the some error reported in the execution and other cases. I that's good to know. That I'm just wondering if there is there are only conclusions based on true positives and false positives, or if there is a comparison of execution time as well of other tools. For example, uh, I really want to know if Scurify really takes more time than Oyente, because you analyze so many contracts. So it would be interesting to know. So is it in the paper maybe, and if not in the slides? Or is it something that you have some, uh, you can summarize maybe that you observed that some tools were taking way more time and some tools were really quick to analyze the contracts? Okay, are you meaning that uh, we analyze the results of each tool? And further, um, actually we only analyze the all results of all tools and we only analyze some case of our analysis of each tool. So um, I will further uh, update our work in future, and our data set will be uh, updated in future. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you. I get it now that the comparison was more, more focused on the accuracy of the tools and not on uh, basically the performance of the, the tools. Uh, the thank performance? Uh, yes. And, in this, in our experiment, we limited the execution time of tools, so, uh -huh, okay. so we do not evaluate their performance. Uh, okay, okay, Th that's good, thank you. Uh, other questions? Hello, so after identifying all these uh, cases or all these patterns where uh, false positives, uh, all, all this amount of false positives occur. Like, can you um, hypothesize what is it that these tools are lacking uh, to actually uh, detect uh, or, or, or trim these false positives? Uh, I mean, uh, because uh, the, 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 all of these all of these tools are only providing true positives on one specific uh, call, type of call, right? And providing a lot of false positives on all these other uh, all these other cases. So, what is it that uh, can, can you can you uh, hypothesize? What is it that these tools uh, are lacking, or what 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 would be the next step in enhancing these tools or in creating a new tool? Oh, okay, okay. Um, I get your means. Uh, Actually, we have made some work to to use this false positive inside to uh, enhance the tools, and we will further do this work at future. Thanks. Yeah, probably we'll take this offline. You can discuss more. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the talk of Beast Hunter detecting and tracing the defects of Bitcoin scripts. I'm Helen Zheng. Our authors are from the Sanstein University and the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. This is the outline of this talk. So, at the beginning, I would like to introduce some basic concepts. Uh, in this session, it is mainly about the uh, blockchain and smart contract. So most of you, as well know, Bitcoin is the first blockchain system. After that, we see Ethereum, Fabric, and recently we see DeFi, sharding, NFT, Layer 2, and so many hot research topics. But in this talk, we want to go back to Bitcoin, to the origin. All right, so Bitcoin platform provides a peer-to-peer -peer payment in a decentralized way, and its transactions for spending and receiving the bitcoins are program, 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 programmable. Okay, sorry. And as shown in this figure, you can see the script inside the inputs and outputs. So if someone sends or receives the bitcoins, actually, the bitcoins are locked in the output scripts. So the problem is that if this output script is buggy, the attackers may store and may steal the bitcoins through leveraging the defects of the scripts. Okay, so if we look into the related works, we can see many studies in the view of Bitcoin data tools, Bitcoin data analysis, and the smart contract defects, right? But few studies focus on the defects of the Bitcoin scripts. So 
What about uh, the face of Bitcoin scripts? This is the major problem of our paper. Next, I will introduce the design. Um, as for the Bitcoin deface, it is non-trivial to detect all of them. Uh, the challenges are, the challenge one, challenge one is lack of systematic de definitions of Bitcoin scripts. Um, to the best of our knowledge, there is no systematic de de definition in Bitcoin. So, because it requires an in-depth study of various script patterns, and we also need to consider the identity attributes and the economic motives. The strange tool is the lack of automatic tools for defeat detection. Because the execution semantic of the non-standard scripts are diverse due to the infinite combination of the operation codes, and especially for the pay to script hash and the pay to witness script hash. These two types, their scripts only records the hash values, which is also challenging. And the challenge three is the lack of verification and tracing of the defects. Um, in our work, we find it hard to prove the correctness of our detection. And in other words, it is hard to trace the defect to see whether it is exploited by the attackers. So here we designed our architecture of the BS Hunter. It includes three modules. First is the de defeat definition. Second is the defeat detection. And the third is the exploitation chasing. It is all about the uh, buggy scripts, right? So first we will introduce the defeat definition. Since Bitcoin is designed as a payment, so we regard the issues in the Bitcoin script that it makes the owners lose their control of valuable payment as defeats. We define four attacker spendable defeats, unbind test ID, usually SIG, uncertain SIG, and simple key, and two never, spend, never spendable defeats, the impossible key and never true. Here shows two examples. The first one is the Unbinded case ID in Bitcoin script, when you are sent a transaction, actually, you are bind the TS ID into some operation codes so that you can prevent your transaction from tampering. But if you don't bind your TS ID, your output scripts may be replaced by the, by the attackers, then your own transaction could be discarded by the network. The second example is the simple key. If you use a simple key, to control your output scripts. So when the attacker listens to the network and it, and it listens to your output scripts, it can spend it immediately. So actually three of them are inspired by the community and the other three are new from us, these six types. Okay, so next time, next we will detect the defects. We first provi provide a address-based method as a naive solution. It used the address interfaces of the Bitcoin clients to detect the, some of the defects, right? Uh, however, it cannot detect all of them, so we propose the symbolic solution. It includes, an, as you can see, it, it includes a symbolic engine, and it used the SMD solver. We use the Z3 prover. And especially for the mentioned pay to script hash and the pay to witness script hash, we construct a historical transaction-based database to find the exact scripts, as you can see on the right upper corner. Okay, so uh, especially for the symbolic engine, we follow the operational semantics of the Bitcoin community, and we need to deal with the symbolic Bitcoin stack transaction parameter, and we deal with some nonlinear operation and the conditional operations. Finally, we will add up a spendable constraint to the branches. So in this way, we can explore all the branches, all the possible branches of the output groups. And after that, we, we defined the patterns, uh, which are represented as the symbolic exp expression to match. If it, it matches the patterns, then the script is considered to be with the Defaced, right? And finally, oh, this is the exploitation chasing. 
we instrument a Bitcoin full node to trace the real world spending transaction and we trace each step of the Bitcoin VM such as the operation codes and uh, stacks. And finally, we use the exploit exploiting rules. Uh, only four types, right? Because two are never spendable. Only four are attacker spendable. So we use the four rules to see if the actual ex actual execution and concrete input are match the exploitation. So this is unlike the symbolic uh, detection, right? Um, as for the experiment, we implement it partially on the BTCD, one of the Bitcoin clients, and partially in Python to implement the symbolic method. And we apply it to all the Bitcoin series from the first uh, 749,000 blocks, which is uh, all the output scripts from October the 2009 to August the 2022, right? And we use it to answer the three research questions. The first research question is about the effectiveness. We find our tools that it supports all the scripts except for the nearly 500,000 scripts. And our proposed symbolic method, if you look into the table, you can see that it increased the number of detected defects by 43%, and the amount by 592% compared to the naive solution, uh, aka the uh, address-based method. And the, however, one threat is that the largest part of the increment comes from 23 scripts. And we have a detailed uh, description in the paper, right? And as for the exploitation tracing, we see that you can see the right upper corner, none of the detected neighbor spendable scripts, scripts uh, has been spent. So in another view of the nearly 76 Bitcoin worth of spent outputs, a total of up to more than 99% of the Bitcoin amount of the deface was traced as being exploited. Right, uh, finally is the Empirical study, we count the script types to see whether it has come from the professor, professional developer or the ordinary user. We find that ordinary users created more buggy scripts, but their scripts involved less amount of, of Bitcoins. And we also count several curves about different types of scripts. We can see that buggy output scripts are still growing recently. So, yeah, I cannot show you the website because of the time and also the machine. So if you log, log into this website, unsafeptc.com, you can see all our codes and results, especially the results we see our, uh, we, you can see the defect detection and this page is the exploitation tracing. You can see the OP codes and the stacks. You can see this, tra this transaction spent a script that is, does not use the does not use the TXID, so it is with the deface, right? So the conclusion is that we design this hunter as the first systematic study on the Bitcoin script the deface, and we define six types of deface. We propose a symbolic method and an exploitation chasing method, and we found some outputs with the empirical chasing result. As for the future work, we think we may be able to apply our work in the Taproot scripts, which is a recently soft fork of Bitcoin and uh, some Bitcoin layer two research. And also the codes and results are provided in our website. And if you are looking for some transaction data set, it is also available. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, yeah, questions? Right. Um, I, I would like to ask you, uh, just out of uh, curiosity, what is the complexity of the symbolic execution of this? If I understand correctly, you, uh, you exploited symbolic execution. So 
For example, is there any constraint that cannot be solved with E3? Are, are there many paths? So what's the complexity? Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, this is showing the RQ1, right? You can see that we support all of the scripts, but except for nearly 500,000 of them, uh, most of them are the taproot scripts. And um, I remember there, there are 400 scripts. That is too complicated. For example, there are too many branches. So the Z3 server cannot solve its constraints in the time. So I, we cannot explore all the possibilities. So we cannot uh, support them. And moreover, there are some operation codes that require some concrete input. For example, it will move a uh, uh, element from the stack from the top to the number third stack. Um, that cannot be represented by the symbol. So that kind of scripts are also not supported because it's too complicated. Uh, that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Other question? Um, yeah, I, I have one question. So um, since I know that the Bitcoin script is much simpler than uh, Solidity, uh, yeah. do you also find the uh, bugs you get from Bitcoin is, is, lesser, uh, is less than from Ethereum? Less from Ethereum? What, what I, mean, do you mean? I mean, it did. Um, if you do, you have like a feeling of uh, like Com comparison yeah, between like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Yeah, uh, I think um, as for Bitcoin, there are many standards. So most of the users they did not develop the scripts by themselves. So this results in that uh, there are not as many as the Ethereum, the DeFi. So. As you can see in this, this figure, the, uh, the scripts that created by the ordinary users, uh, they, are major, they are mainly in the uh, impossible key and the simple key and others. So these are not due to the code, the complexity of the code. This is human behavior. Uh, so this is the differences between Bitcoin and the Ethereum contracts. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jian Fei Zhou. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm from University of uh, Electronic Science and Technology of China. And uh, today I'm going to introduce our research results on uh, identifying consistent behaviors of decentralized applications. Uh, so let's start. Uh, I will first talk a little about the depths. Then I will discuss the motivation behind our idea and introduce the design in details. Uh, finally, I will share, share the evaluation results. So let's come to the first part. Uh, as you can see, a typical DAP usually consists a graphical user interface as its front end, and uh, the front end can be a web page or a mobile app, and a smart contract as the back end of a DAP. Uh, the front end of DAP delegates its core functionality to the smart contracts deployed on the blockchain network and users can interact with the front end to use these functions. And we must mention the blockchain wallets. Uh, they help users uh, to manage their accounts and uh, sign or publish their transactions to the blockchain network easily. Uh, now let's talk about the problem we want to solve. Uh, you know, the workflow of DAP seems to be sound and convenient as you can use a graphical user interface, but uh, we, s we believe uh, it also brings some risks. Uh, first thing is the DAP front end may generate the transactions that are inconsistent with the user's intentions. 
Uh, and here is a real world example, and it happens in appeal 2022. Uh, so if I am a victim, uh, when I see the web page of this step, uh, it is showing an eye-catching button, uh, free mint. So I would expect if I click the button and I can mint NFTs for free. Uh, however, when I click the button, the front end will generate a malicious transaction, which will approve all my NFTs to this step. Uh, that means they have full control of my uh, NFTs and they can steal them at any time. Uh, so here comes the problems we want to solve. Uh, first is how to obtain the actual functions of DEVs front end and smart contract before we actually using them. Uh, and how to identify these inconsistent behaviors. Uh, so let's talk about our ideas. Uh, and uh, our key idea is to compare the behaviors of depths that derived from three information sources, that is the front end, the blockchain wallet, and smart contracts. And uh, our idea is simple and straight. Uh, yes, uh, the user's actions on the front end, uh, it uh, reflects their intention and expectations. So when the behavior uh, the user expects mismatches the behavior suggested by the transaction data or the execution trees of the smart contracts, uh, from the user's perspective, they will feel the DEP has inconsistent, uh, inconsistent behaviors and uh, very confusing. Uh, but uh, to implement this idea uh, have some challenges. The first one is, as you can see in this figure, uh, the front end of that, uh, they usually consist a lot of interactive items, and uh, some of them have a second level menu, but uh, if I'm a user of this step, I will to uh, I need to perform uh, seven to 10 front end actions continuously. And if we randomly combine them, uh, the front end action space uh, is up to 10 to 10 powers. So that is too big for random searching. Um, but we have uh, ob uh, observation uh, is if the user wants to treat the tokens on this step, the front end action sequence is limited. He will click the connect wallet button and uh, click the choose token to choose the tokens he want to trade and input the amount he want to trade. And uh, finally, he click the uh, swap button. So it is a very simple front end action sequence. So our approach is based on this observation. Uh, though the front end action sequence is animals, but the option of front end actions to realize a specific user in, uh, intention are limited. Um, the first part of our, our approach is user intention driven interaction. And the purpose of this approach is to interact with the DAP to explore its behavior from the front end. And our idea is uh, under the guidance uh, of the intention action graph, we can explore the physical user intention and corresponding front end action sequence to realize a, a specific user intention. Mm. This approach consists of two steps. First, we construct an uh, intention action graph by gradually adding front end action sequences, and then we explore the front end action sequence. Uh, in the graph and uh, uses a front end robot to simulate all the actions. And uh, here is an uh, example. Uh, the intention action graph I mentioned in the previous slide is a two layer graph. Uh, it consists of a high level user intention graph and uh, several low level front end action graphs. And uh, a node in the upper level is, uh, represents uh, a user intention, and uh, a node in the front end action graph uh, denotes a specific front end action. Uh, so, assuming we already const uh, constructed such a graph, and 
I will use this example to illustrate how to explore the front end action sequence. So on the upper layer, uh, we first search for user intentions that can be realized uh, in the user intention graph uh, under the current front end state. Uh, we will search in the web page to uh, find the interactive items that uh, are related to the user intentions. Uh, for example, if we want to uh, connect the wallet, we will search the buttons in the web page that uh, have some keywords like connect or wallet. Uh, so uh, in this example, we will find a uh, front end action sequence consists uh, uh, five steps. Uh, first is to uh, search a button and uh, we will click it to connect the wallet. And then we will choose the wallet we want to use and uh, select the currency we want to trade, uh, then we will input the, am the amount and click the swipe button so we can finish the trade. And the second part of this approach is inconsistency comparison. Uh, uh, this method is proposed to compare the behaviors uh, derived from uh, the front end, the wallet, and the smart contract. And uh, since uh, data from the front end and the wallet and the smart contracts are in different uh, forms, so we will come up to the semantic behavior to solve this problem. Uh, we will uh, denote them in a unified uh, form named the semantic behavior, and uh, uh, it is uh, tuples. Uh, the first uh, item is its type, that is what we want to do with the DAP. And uh, the second is a list, it denotes the parameter uh, to use the DAP. And here is an uh, example. Uh, on the left side is the uh, front end action sequence to realize the intention, uh, that is to swap the BNB tokens to the MOIN tokens. And uh, in the middle is the transaction data and we will uh, parse the data and uh, decoding it use uh, its function API. And uh, the third one is uh, smart contract execution traces uh, from a local node, and we will uh, analyze all the events and the function calls and uh, transform into the, unifo uh, the unified semantic behavior. And, and you can see all of them are consistent. Uh, so uh, let's say uh, the evaluation part. Uh, we collect uh, 92 real-world dApps uh, with front-end uh, from dApp browsers, blockchain browsers, and social media. And in this data set, it contains uh, 37 constant dApps. Uh, this result is uh, with our menu check. And uh, in our experiment, uh, we found uh, all of them and uh, uh, with 100% uh, precision. And uh, 35 of them are scam depths and uh, two of them are uh, ordinary depths, but their front end are hacked by the crackers and uh, they were injected the malicious code. Uh, thank you. Uh, any questions? Well, I noticed that you build a uh, you build a uh, graph based on the based on the front end. Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, how long will the graph will be? Uh, may the graph it is, uh, may the graph it is a loop. But I mean, if you press if if you enter the password and you press A B C and you press backspace backspace backspace, uh, it means that you does nothing. Will it appear in the graph? Oh. So are you asking if there are any circles or loop paths in the graph? Yeah. Uh, uh, and our approach guarantees uh, the intention action graph is a directed uh, acyclic graph. So um, because when we input the front end action uh, consequences, uh, we only put uh, the 
consequence that uh, with no forks. So uh, in the intention action graph, that, uh, there will be no circles or loops. OK, I see. Okay. Yeah, next. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, can you go back to your previous slide? Um, OK. Maybe maybe I didn't catch that, and you said it. But no, no, the one after. Uh, where oh. did you? Uh, how did you get the ground truth? Right, if you say true positive, true negative, so where does the ground truth come from? Uh, so uh, we we manually check the depths, uh, so we can confirm that they do have some. Uh, inconsistent behaviors and some of the uh, depths used in this uh, experiment are collected from the, uh, you know, the technical reports uh, by the uh, blockchain security companies like Slow Mist and uh, Security. So uh, that's our ground truth. Okay. Um and the, the other question I didn't uh, I had and I didn't fully understand from your talk is, uh, you're talking about user intention, right? Yes. So, uh, I mean, for something like uh, you know trading tokens, etc., uh, I see how you can derive that from the UI. But is is sort of your approach limited to applications where you know upfront like that belong to a a limited class of applications where you can actually determine the user intention from the UI, or do you have an answer for like a more general case there? Okay, uh, I, I get your uh, question. Uh, yes, we have a specific limitation. Uh, uh, our approach currently supports uh, about uh, seven to eight intentions uh, that we define them before we uh, implement our tools, uh, but uh, we think the eight uh, uh, intentions can, uh, you know, can cover most of the depths in the market now, and uh, we can support more types of intentions uh, by adding the definitions and uh, they are from an action sequence in the future. Hi everyone, I'm Burju. I'll be presenting our case study on Ripple's XRP ledger consensus algorithm for an evolutionary approach for concurrency testing. This is a joint work with Anibali, who is also here, and our master student, Martijn. As you know, um, Ripple's, Ripple, uh, which maintains XRP cryptocurrency, is one of the most popular blockchains. And when we say a blockchain, we talk about a distributed ledger. So the ledger is replicated among a set of processes, which are also called validators in this context. And these validators work, operate concurrently to serve multiple client requests. And of course, for correctness, these validators need to agree on which transactions to issue, how to group them into blocks, and the total order of blocks to append to the blockchain. For agreement, Ripple uses XRP ledger consensus algorithm. Different from the consensus in uh, proof, of proof of work based systems like Bitcoin or Ethereum, Ripple uses the, follows the design patterns of the traditional consensus algorithms in distributed computing. So the consensus algorithm is structured into a sequence of communication rounds. In each of, we, uh, in each of the rounds, the nodes exchange some messages to vote for what to do. So it starts with an open phase where all the processes collect the transactions to include in a ledger. So assume that P3 has uh, received a transaction from a client, then it disseminates it in the network so that everyone um, uh, ha has the transaction. After some point of time, the validators move to proposal round, where they propose the collected set of transactions to be committed and exchange it broadcast to each other. After a certain amount of time passes or, the, um, of, or certain majority of votes have been collected with agreement, then they move to validation 
round, and they validate the ledger to be committed. So the execution goes uh, in a sequence of proposal and validation rounds. So each proposal and validation commits a block. Of course, this is a simplified version of the protocol. A proposal round actually has many iterations in it to get the missing transactions and so on. But this is the overall structure. So it looks uh, nice and simple, but actually it is hard to implement and design these algorithms correctly. Because these algorithms run on a distributed network where the rate of, rate of the process's uh, speed can differ. The messages are asynchronous. There may be delays, reorderings, everything. So the developers need to think about all possible things that can happen in the network while they are implementing their algorithms. So when I'm designing and when, I, when I'm uh, writing the code, I think like my algorithm runs in those synchronized structures. But this is not the case. My algorithm actually runs with all reorderings and things. So the question we explore is, does the algorithm run correctly under all concurrency scenarios? And our action for uh, tackling the question is concurrency testing. So in this case study, we first check how the simplest naive random concurrency testing algorithms perform for Ripple. And then we will explore whether we can design an evolutionary algorithm to guide the search. Starting with the naive random concurrency testing, I'll first highlight that this is actually naive random controlled concurrency testing. Because if you were to stress test your system run a bunch of times, you would most likely get the same uh, or similar uh, execution schedules. So we control the scheduler so that we can control which messages to um, execute, whether to delay them or reorder them. And we use uh, two algorithms. The first one is priority-based concurrency testing, which um, assigns priorities to the individual messages. So here is the scheduler we hacked, so collects all the messages from the pro uh, processes. Uh, let's say there are two proposed messages, one status change messages collected by the scheduler. Now we assign random priorities to all those messages, and the scheduler schedules the highest priority event. And in the meanwhile, there may be more events popping up. We insert them to the priority queue based on their randomly assigned priorities, and then sch uh, continue scheduling the execution. So different priorities, of course, gives us a permutation of um, events. In delay-based random testing, this time we assign some time delays to the messages. So for example, for this proposed message, if we assign one and a half seconds, then we delay the execution of that and schedule it only after this timeout passes. So this again gives us a permutation of the messages together with some delays. And here are the experiments. Uh, we applied the, the testing algorithms on three versions of the Ripple source code. Two of them, we seeded some bugs to check the effectiveness of the algorithms. And the third one is the original source code. In our test uh, setup, we ran uh, five nodes in a private network and submitted four concurrent transactions. As the uh, test correctness, we, used, we checked the consensus correctness. So basically, we checked for agreement, validity, integrity, and termination of consensus. Here, this table shows the results of running 10 runs with each of the settings. So uh, with each of the benchmarks and algorithms, we have 10 runs. Each of the runs uh, take for an hour. So we run uh, for an hour with priority based each benchmarks and detected the number of runs reported the number of runs which detected the bugs. And as we can see here, in our experiments, time delay-based random testing outperformed priority-based testing. It detects more bugs in the benchmarks. It detects the bugs more number of times. And also, you will notice that we also report some violations in the original Ripple source code. We detected a violation, which I'll come towards the end of the talk. So here, first, we uh, answered the question for naive random testing. And we said that they are successful at detecting bugs and also time delay performed better. One challenge with uh, concurrency testing is that the executions, the buggy executions, are hard to find. So they occur only in subtle reordering, subtle delays. So they are in the weird positions of the search space. 
So now we ask whether we can use evolutionary algorithms to guide the search towards the executions which are likely to be buggy. Evolutionary algorithms mimic the biological uh, evolution for the optimization process. So we start with an initial set of uh, individuals, which in our case are concurrency tests. Then we evolve them towards certain fitness criteria using some variation operations. So, uh, our individuals, our test cases, are delay-based tests, and we represent them with maps that map like um, the sender, receiver of the messages, and the me message verb to some amount of delay. So we create a bunch of those delay-based tests, and then we evaluate how fit, how good they are. So we run those executions, and for fitness evaluation, we use two different fitness functions. One of them is the, the, the execution time-based fitness, so it rewards the executions, which takes more time to achieve consensus, thinking like something may be fishy, so it can be buggy. And the second fitness uh, function is proposal fitness. This fitness uh, rewards the executions where we go for more number of proposals to uh, commit a transaction. Again, the intuition is that if it takes uh, more proposals, they can't do agreement in certain rounds, maybe something's going wrong and things can be buggy. So we select the best, um, best test cases out of the uh, population and uh, apply variation operations, crossover and mutation. So with crossover, we used a simulated binary crossover, which allows us to combine the real values in the timeout, uh, delay timeout values. And then for mutation, we incorporate some more randomness for exploration using a Gaussian mutation. So here are the results. The experimental setup is the same. Now we compare the evolutionary algorithm with proposal fitness and time fitness to the naive random execution with time delay. We have 30 runs, and we report the number of uh, runs that detect bugs. What we observe from the table is that evolutionary algorithm successfully directs the execution towards buggy executions, because we detect them more frequently in our tests. And also, in our experiments, time fitness outperformed the proposal fitness. As I said earlier, our case study also discovered a new violation of consensus, which was not uh, known before. So in this, uh, here is a simple illustration of the buggy execution. And in the buggy execution, two processes uh, had in their proposal rounds uh, missed some transactions. And in that case, they asked for the transaction by sending a get ledger message on the network. So normally what happens is that after this get ledger message, the process is having the transaction replies with the ledger data so that everyone synchronizes and continues. In the buggy execution, we delay, this, um, we delay the delivery of ledger data. So what happens is that the, the process is missing a transaction first start a transaction acquire object, which periodically sends get ledger messages. So if ledger data arrives after six seconds after this object is created, then the object times out, and the node cannot get the transaction, and leaves the process uh, stuck in the proposed phase and can, cannot move to validation uh, of the next ledger. So we reported the uh, violation to developers, and it's under investigation, but it highlights that the timing and synchrony assumption in the execution of consensus algorithms. So to sum up, we described the uh, Ripple's XRP ledger consensus algorithm, and we said in the distributed network, things don't go that smooth and everything is re reordered. So we first applied simple naive random concurrency testing algorithms and also designed an evolutionary algorithm. Our case study detected a new bug, and our findings are that Naive random concurrency testing methods are successful at detecting concurrency bugs. In our case, the time delay based testing worked better. And we also saw that it is possible to guide the search through the bugs that, to, the, to the executions that are more likely to buggy using an evolutionary approach. 
Here we use time fitness and proposal fitness, where time fitness outperformed proposal fitness. But this work opens up, um, leaves many possible improvements or many possible alternative <laughs> explorations. So we can explore other representations. We can use other variation operators, different fitness functions, or apply to different systems. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions? So, uh, thanks for the presentation. So, the bug that you found in this, uh, uh, was that an algorithmic bug or was that a bug in the implementation? And I was curious as to whether formal verification or such techniques would have found the same bug without, say, using a uh, technique like yours. Thank you. In this work, we focus on implementation bugs, so we, we could potentially detect both the bugs in the design and also implementation. So in the uh, design of the high level of the protocol, uh, these um, seconds and milliseconds uh, are, are not... Um, so in the design of the protocol, they talk about the synchronized rounds, but the seconds go into more into the implementation. So. Uh, th this is, of course, to discuss with the developers if the protocol design actually says, like, uh, expire after close to six seconds or not. Uh, we detected this in the implementation. I'm not aware of the exact seconds and milliseconds in the uh, design. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I would say that we detect implementation bugs, and whether this is a design bug or implementation bug will be more clear after we conclude the discussion with the developers. Uh, okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jia Shuo Zhang, uh, and I'm a PhD yes, student I from you. Peking Thank University. You. Uh, so, uh, in this presentation, I will introduce our demonstration paper, uh, Seaguard Detecting Signature Related Vulnerabilities in Smart Contracts. Uh, so, signature have been widely used in smart contracts uh, for ancient identity authentication and access control. It has spawned numerous applications and also attracted uh, extensive attention from the community. However, while bringing uh, innovations to smart contracts, it also uh, faced the new attack surface, and due to the transparency of the blockchain, all signatures as well as their senders, receivers, and the verification logic in the receiving contract are publicly available. Uh, and this has uh, introduced a fairly strong adversary capabilities and caused new security issues. For example, many security teams reported that uh, several smart contracts uh, might suffer signature replay attacks. Uh, however, uh, uh, this new attack surface is not well studied, so the community still lacks tools and knowledge to mitigate the threat. And uh, to bridge the gap, we conducted the first study uh, focusing on the signature-related vulnerabilities. Uh, so uh, theoretically, we characterized two types of signature-related vulnerabilities in smart contracts. And we also proposed Seaguard, the first automatic tool to detect these vulnerabilities. Uh, we also conducted a preliminary experiment to validate the effectiveness of Seaguard. It uh, successfully finds uh, 52 uh, signature-related vulnerabilities out of 1,000 smart contracts. Uh, so uh, our classification of the vulnerabilities is de uh, derived from the real-world adversary model, where the, uh, where the adversary mainly have two capabilities. The first is to replace historical signatures, that it can re uh, retrieve uh, the signatures uh, to the victim contract on-chain, and uh, replay it to the victim contract. And uh, if something goes wrong in the contract, it will consider the uh, replayed signature as valid and do some uh, sensitive operations, uh, such as transfer repeatedly. Uh, so uh, specifically, uh, this is because the victim contract implements the signature verification in a stateless way. That is, it only verifies uh, the validity of the signature without checking whether the signature has been used. So, uh, it, uh, so uh, consequently, uh, the smart contract will always accept these valid but being replayed signatures. Uh, so uh, we, we call this uh, vulnerability as stateless signature verification. Uh, so the second adversary capability is 
replacing signatures from other contracts. Uh, this is a little weird, uh, but given uh, that uh, many smart contracts are clones in, on Ethereum, so uh, the attacker may retrieve <laughs> the signature for other contracts and replay it to the victim contract. And again, if something goes wrong in the victim contract, it will also consider the signature as valid uh, and uh, do some unexpected uh, operations. Uh, uh, so in this example, there are two token contracts, token A and token B, and they implement the same permit function uh, that you can use a, a signature from the owner to transfer your uh, tokens. Uh, so uh, uh, most importantly, the signed message does not contain the unique contract address. Uh, so this means a signature valid for token A will also be valid for token B. So a malicious spender can uh, replace the signatures for token A to, uh, to token B and successfully uh, receive token B. So, uh, 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 so even though uh, the token approver never intends to approve token B to the spender. Uh, so, uh, uh, we developed Seeger to detect these uh, vulnerabilities, and due to time constraints, I can only uh, very briefly introduce the workflow, and please refer to our papers for more details. So it, uh, generally, it takes the bytecode as input, and then constructs the crypto flow graph. And it, uh, then it, based, uh, uh, it explores the, uh, the CFG based on symbolic execution to find uh, which execution path is related to signature verification. Uh, also, it, uh, it also conducts a tent analysis, dy dynamic tent analysis to track uh, signature-related uh, data flow information. Uh, uh, first, it tracks uh, all hash uh, pre-images uh, for hash variables, and also tracks which hash variable is used for signature verification. So based on these two information, Sigur detects these two types of vulnerabilities. Uh, and finally report the, uh, generate the analysis report. Uh, so we also have deployed uh, Seagull uh, as a public web service, so welcome to try Seagull at seagull.xyz. Uh, uh, since this is a very preliminary work, uh, we have a lot of future works to do. Uh, for example, we will improve the detection technique to, uh, such as uh, identify more protective patterns and reduce the false positives and the negatives we also will conduct a large-scale analysis to fully understand the damage and the prevalence of signature-related attacks in the decentralized world. So uh, this will conclude our talk. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Uh, question? Uh, hi. Yeah, thank you. Can you uh, go back a few slides to where you showed the second uh, vulnerability? Um, uh, okay. Uh, maybe the one before? Uh, so yeah, that one I didn't understand because the signature, at least on Ethereum, uh, you would have the signature for the whole transaction, right? Uh, uh, and yes. the transaction includes the recipient address, which identifies the smart contract. So you couldn't port one signature from calling one smart contract to another. So I didn't understand how you do this uh, replaying here. Uh, yes, uh, we don't focus on transaction level signature replay. Uh, that means this signature is not for the transaction sender to, send, uh, to sign. Uh, it means the signature is attacked as, a, as the transaction input data, and the contract will imp, uh, verify the signature uh, to do some uh, sensitive operations, rather than checking the, uh, whether the transa transaction itself is from the right sender. So uh, uh, it's contract level rather than transaction level. Yeah, usually you... Uh, typically, you kind of combine them. So how, how often does that happen that smart contracts require another signature? Have uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, for example, uh, ERC-20 uh, uh, has a very popular extension called ERC-20 Permit. Uh, it al allows users to uh, uh, attach a signature in the transaction input data uh, to approve its tokens to 
uh, the uh, to to anyone. Uh, rather than instead of uh, let the use uh, let the token owner to uh, initial transaction and send it on Ethereum. So uh, uh, an option signature can replace an on chain transaction. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, the speaker again. Uh, Hey everyone, uh, my name is Maha Ayu from Blockchain Security Lab, Pakistan, and I'm here to present our paper on storage state analysis and extraction of Ethereum blockchain smart contract, which accepted at ACM Journal Transaction of Software Engineering and Methodology, or TOSA. Uh, this work in collaboration with Tanya Salim, Mohammed Omar Janjwa, and Talha Ahmed, also from Blockchain Security Lab, ITU. As many of you know, Ethereum is one of the largest blockchain platform uh, and it supports the execution of smart contracts. The smart contracts, which are the piece of code that enables secure peer-to-peer -peer transactions without the need for a trusted intermediary. Uh, where immutability of smart contracts give us security and transparency, it also become hurdles in upgrading them because any change in smart contracts create a new instance uh, with empty state instead of updating the older one and the availability of previous state must be necessary to resume the state of smart contract after upgrade. And another aspect we explore is the migration of smart contracts from one blockchain to another. As the blockchain landscape involves organization may find it necessary to switch to a different blockchain platform to remain competitive and ensure enhanced security. However, the current data migration techniques for smart contracts are often manual and involve lengthy processes. So in both smart contract migration and upgrade processes, the presence of smart contracts poses a great challenge. In upgrade, the current available tools and techniques for smart contract upgrades includes data logic separations, uh, in which data and business logic incorporates into separate smart contracts. The next one is delegate-based calls. Uh, the other one is replay transactions. And the lastly, the most popular, the open Zeppelin platform uh, that also provide uh, data upgrades based on the delegate-based calls. However, despite this, all these tools and techniques, there are also several limitations to consider. Uh, the, firstly, most of the approaches are applicable only before the contract deployment. Once the contract is deployed, making substantial changes become more challenging. Additionally, when employing data logic separation, it is important to note that, that while the logic contracts can upgrade it, the data contracts remains unchanged. Uh, and if you need to uh, upgrade the data contracts, we have still have the same problem that we need to uh, deploy new instance of data contract. Uh, and same, lastly, the replay transactions may not always be work uh, due to the presence of uh, uh, center nodes in the transaction hashes, hashes, which can affect the execution order and results in inconsistency when replaying the transactions. Same as in migrations, uh, we have tools like wallets that supports the asset transfer but not from data migration. Uh, for uh, data migration is to rely on the manual approaches. Uh, Very smart is also another technique proposed for migrating smart contracts, but it still needs the same story structure as EDM or Ethereum, along with no changes in the data structure of the smart contracts. And it copy as it is state of the smart contract to another uh, blockchain. And finally, the most users things and rely on the replaying transactions, which not only increase the cost, uh, but still, uh, we have the same problem of standard nodes uh, or in the transaction hashes. So to make the availability of smart contract state for the migration and upgrade processes, we must deeply analyze the storage state of uh, smart contracts. On deploying the smart contracts in Ethereum blockchain, an empty storage try or array is a sign that holds the value of uh, each state variables in the smart contracts. In its array, each load is 32 bytes and uh, assigned to each state variable in a sequence in which they declare in a smart contract. The state variables, including elementary, arrays, user defines, 
uh, are easily extractable from the fixed lot uh, of the storage drive, uh, uh, but instead of hash uh, mapping structures. Uh, because mapping structures are the hash maps, uh, and there are uh, and whose values are distributed in the EVM storage not sequentially. The keys of the mapping structure are not stored in the storage along with the values. Instead, they hash with the one fixed slots uh, assigned due to the deployment of smart contracts and the values stored on the uh, hash addresses that are combined with these slot, this slot values. So for extracting the mapping structures of a smart contract, we must have the complete list of all the keys that inserted in the mapping during the smart contract lifetime. So the main challenging part in extracting uh, the complete storage of smart contract is extracting the mapping keys of the mapping data structures. So for uh, accommodate this problem, uh, we design a smart move, uh, a storage state analysis tool uh, that extracts the storage state of Ethereum smart contracts and enable analysis, packing of the state, and then upgrade the smart contracts where possible. It's an automatic technique that employs source code analysis of the smart contracts and retrieve real values from the deployed smart contract. The smart move tool uh, uses the source code of smart contract as an input. Uh, and firstly, they perform the slot calculation to calculate the slot of all state variables. Afterward, uh, the mapping slot uh, passes to the key approximation al uh, algorithm that analyzes the control flow graph of the smart contract source codes and that mine the origin of each mapping key uh, that are uh, you insert or uh, include in the uh, mapping uh, structure. Subsequently, uh, the extraction algorithm uses this information and uh, use the transaction of, of blockchain to get all the function uh, to get all the mapping keys from the function argument that is used as a key for mapping, and then all the elementary mapping and non-mapping variables are extracted from the blockchain storage. And finally, this extracted state is upgraded into a new smart contract source code. And also this state is used for the migration uh, to any other blockchain platform. So uh, along with the, the methodology, we also evaluate our tool on 34,000 smart contracts and we successfully extract all the states uh, uh, for the smart contracts with the total keys determined is the total of 184,000 keys determined. Uh, the main key finding from open analysis is the identification of approximately 90% mapping keys are originated or come from the parameters of the function calls. 5% uh, from are hard coded in the source code. Some are the values of the keys depend on the state variable values of the smart contracts. And the finally, only 0.9% we have a runtime values uh, that are not extracted statically uh, and we can miss during the extractions. Finally, the soundness, we also ensured the soundness of mapping key extraction algorithm uh, to ensuring that we cannot, we not miss any key. Uh, we may be over approximated our uh, mapping keys uh, set, uh, but we do not include, uh, we do not miss any key. But with the expense of including, uh, definitely including some false positive, some over approximated values. Uh, but uh, the uh, plus point is that, that these false positives can also eliminate it during the extraction of mapping values. Because originally when uh, smart contract deployment, uh, empty array is assigned uh, to the smart contract. So when during extraction, if and we uh, consider a key that, is, that does not uh, insert it during the lifetime of smart contracts, we must we find a zero value on uh, on that uh, on that specified key, or we do not need to copy the zero values. So for, for simply we can skip it. So if we, our smart contract does not contain any uh, runtime value or any value that we are not extracted uh, statically, we can 100% extract uh, the complete list of mapping keys and which directly uh, implies that we can completely extract the complete state of uh, uh, the smart contracts. Uh, the future vision is uh, to make our analysis more comprehensive. We expand our key approximation algorithm to reduce the runtime values by incorporating the function calls and events, uh, which 
create the runtime values and this uh, improvement also allow to capture more comprehensive picture of the smart contract storage behavior and provide uh, more accurate insights and recommendations uh, additionally in our organ research we also uh, aim to synthesize upgrade specific code skeletons these code skeletons we serve as a template or guideline for developers uh, assisting them in using the cost uh, that are paying uh, now for upgrading the smart contracts uh, and uh, providing this uh, pre-designed post structure developers can benefit from the best practices and standardized approaches to ensure efficient and reliable upgrades. And also uh, the users can get benefits from this storage extraction during the, uh, as we know, many black blockchain platforms uh, are appear and in more time we have more uh, platforms. And uh, we can hope that this smart move is play a vital role in uh, data uh, extraction, migration, and updates. Uh, and finally, uh, if you want to know more about SmartProof and interesting in any suggestions and collaborations and any further queries, please feel free to, free to contact me. And thank you so much for all your time. OK, thank you. <laughs> Question? So, any questions? I have one question. So uh, it seems that your approach now relies on source code. But let's see if the source any code questions, is not... any suggestions regarding this. Uh, I'm. I mean, let's see if the source code is not those. available. How um, difficult it will become. Right? Um, how well your approach may. Uh, can you uh, your approach be applied in a situation where the source code is unavailable? Uh, that's, this is the one drawback that uh, currently we are relying on the source code of the uh, contracts. Uh, we can also apply these uh, approaches on the bytecode level, uh, but uh, the currently approach is on the source code. So we must need the source code for analyzing and performing this uh, and all the analysis and extracting the storage state. Okay, got it. Thanks. Um, other question? Okay, thank you. Uh, so that concludes uh, this session on blockchain smart contracts. And thank you, uh, thank you again for all the presenters and also all the audience for joining us in session. So it's lunchtime.